Well, hello and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce evolution podcast. I'm your host, Brett Curry, CEO of OMG Commerce. And today we are talking with Charles Titchener from disruptorschool.com. We're talking about Facebook ads and social and AI and all kinds of crazy fun stuff to help you grow your business. And uh, quick background, I-, I met Charles first at Geek Out San Diego. I was speaking there, shout out to Nick Shackelford, met Charles there. I was like, whoa, who is this crazy, crazy smart guy? And, um, and so we, we met there. And then Blue Ribbon, also San Diego, uh, yeah. separate events over time. We, we met there because you were speaking with my buddy Jeremiah Allen. And so we really connected and hung out there. I think over the uh, cigar party potentially, but but anyway, Charles and I were chatting. We're like, "Dang, this is a podcast episode. Let's do it." So here you are. So Charles, what's up, man? Um, and and I want I want I want you to shed light on a couple things, and I got a couple of um, intro questions for you. But All right, let's you were do once it. listed as top 100 advertiser on Facebook. You've yes. generated a billion dollars in revenue from Facebook ads. Like these are some crazy, yes. crazy statistics. What do yeah. you attribute that to? Like, how have you become this this monster? Maybe that, that some people don't know about on on face with Facebook ads. Um, I think it really comes down to three things. First off, is luck and timing, in that I basically was spending seven figures a day before there was a Facebook Pixel. So <laughs> the fact that I was Crazy. supervisor at Omnicom for the Resolution Media, the Performance Marketing Division. Uh, overseeing Nissan and CBS and Henkel, working with Activision and and Levi's and Apple Um, back in like 2013, 2014, just right place, right time, right? So that's always a key place of things. There's nothing you could beat that. Um, I think a second thing was that I did get a very strong background in data science and analysis. So I have like an MBA from a Harvard Business Review. And um, what that really helped me do was when I was spending that money, I was always doing case studies. I was always doing very aggressive testing. Um, And what that meant was back at the time, there was like one rep at Facebook for everybody west of the Mississippi River. And nobody wanted to talk to them because Facebook was this ugly, redhead stepchild of a thing that nobody, I mean, everybody in the room was all about Yahoo. Nobody understood it. Yeah. So me and this guy became best friends. And anytime there was a new tool or they were building up a new team or new, you know, ad type, um, I had a seven figure budget to test it. Um, One of the first big wins we had was I launched the first lead gen ads on Facebook. So not only did I have huge budgets, but I also had, uh, you know, master's degree education on conducting case studies and data analysis for marketing. So I kind of became the Chuck Yeager of Facebook ads, one of not the only one, but a few of them just kind of test piloting a million things. So by the time other people got to see stuff, Facebook was funding me at $10,000, $50,000 a day sometimes on new tools. And and that still happens to this day, um, which has given me tremendous insight in how the platform was developed, the tools, how they're being designed, the product teams behind marketing and messenger and 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 measurement how they all were actually working together and i've seen those teams evolve over years and i think the last thing is that i had the luxury of not learning how to run facebook ads from somebody that was good at email or search or programmatic Mm. i kind of came in fresh which meant that i have a huge advantage over most people or I did, and I try to teach that advantage because I look at Facebook not as a version of Google Display or of email. And I don't value the same metrics in the same way that most other people do. And I've always looked at it through the lens of business results. And that has made me a really bad agency employee. Yeah. But ultimately, when I got to the side of vendor and e-commerce, <laughs> um, made me one of the best. You know, I'm on my fourth eight-figure business to a nine-figure exit in the last five years that started as a low-end seven-figure business. Dude, that's not bad. It's not luck. Eventually, it's a yeah. process. You do that once, and that's cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Four, almost on your fourth. That, that's fantastic. Uh, but it's that's such an interesting point, though. We all, and, and just realizing we all come to whatever we're working on with a paradigm, right? So you came to Facebook ads, but really... 
not with the paradigm of Google or TV ads or something like that. If I were to approach and try to dig into Facebook, I would totally look at it from the lens of Google ads and YouTube because that's what I know. Uh, yeah. That fresh perspective uh, is useful. And I think, like you said, you can kind of unlearn that a little bit and, and, and force yourself to have a fresh perspective, which is pretty cool. So uh, amazing, amazing ways to learn, you know, seven figure a day budgets and Facebook letting you be an alpha tester, beta tester, things like that. That's awesome. So fast forward to today, uh, quick shout out to Triple Whale and, and Raba, mutual friend of ours. You were just nominated for a Whaley, which is brand new. That's Triple Whale's award they give out in the D2C industry. Um, sadly, you did not win, but it's still a happy story. Uh, yeah. So talk about what were you nominated for and, and, and how did you finish in the uh, final rankings there? Yeah, so they had a lot of awards. Um, best, you know, most innovative brands and communities and all of that. I was nominated for the last award, um, uh, which was best operator, um, which was tremendous. I mean, it was the, an amazing award to be recognized like that. Um, and sadly I, I didn't win, but Renee from Marine Layer did win. And Mazel Tov, if I'm going to lose to somebody, I'll lose to that woman that is doing 200 Dude. million plus totally. retail locations. Hey, look, it's, it's triple whale. She's, a, she's the bigger whale than me. Um, I'll come for her next year. <laughs> and phenomenal you know, give me, brand. Give me, give me I mean, 12 just, months. Just a great I'll win. Story. Yeah. And uh, so it was, it, was a, it was an honor. And if, if you have to lose, losing, losing to the best feels really good. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you, man. Well, well kudos to you to become runner-up for the inaugural Whaley's as best operator. It's like their best picture, you know, if we're going to compare this to the Oscars. Yeah. So well done, and and uh, tip the hat to Marine Layer for sure. So awesome, man. Well, let's let's dive in. So uh, we're going to talk Facebook and TikTok and social and AI and a lot of a lot of fun stuff. But what are some of the changes that have happened with Facebook ads over the last six eight months that maybe some people aren't aware of yet? Yeah, I think the biggest change that we're seeing is the unfair advantage that Facebook is giving to Advantage Plus campaigns right now, which is a certain style of running an ad. It's, it's, um, it's a certain campaign type that, that's an option. Um, I was doing some of the tests about a year ago where they were giving us about 10,000 a day to test it. And it's a slight change in the way that Facebook is using their data to target the right people to get results. Historically, once Facebook introduced the conversion pixel, which again, I, I remember when that was like, that was, that was a greater, that was more traumatic to the industry than iOS 14 ever was, um, which, you know, it was just wild. Um, like iOS 14 was a roadblock, it was like a speed bump, you know what I mean? In, in comparison to the but, end but, of but days. But the, the conversion pixel, that was, a, that was traumatic, mostly in a good way, right? For Facebook advertisers, it was traumatic maybe yes, for the rest and, of the industry. Yes and no. Um, I saw so many agencies refuse to adopt the conversion objectives. Mm -hmm. They really dove into PPC. And Facebook, to be fair, was designed to compete with Google Display. And when they refused to adopt machine learning, there were folks that bought into it that were really successful. All the brands that got really big in 2016, 2017, 2018, because Facebook ads are really easy adopted it there are other agencies that fought it that lost like floors in their manhattan office yeah, uh, it was a massive um kind of either you were on one side of that divide or the other and mm -hmm. to bring it back to advantage plus we're seeing a very interesting piece come in where facebook is underpricing the attention specifically to invest in a change in consumer behavior. They've done this previously with dynamic product ads, carousel ads. Before that, there was no carousel. And those are the ads where you swipe through left and you just see all the products. There was nothing like that beforehand. And what Facebook did was they gave a discount on how much it costs to reach people, specifically making the investment to change consumer behavior. To be fair, they also did it with Canvas ads, which failed miserably. Um, and uh, I, I look, I made a lot of mistakes with Canvas ads. I completely bet on it and failed miserably. And Call of Duty was still the number one game that year. 
Uh, so kind of shows you how that works. Uh, and we're also seeing them make the investment in shops. Where a lot of people running Facebook ads have noticed that there's like a 20% off on the shop side. And that's Facebook making an investment to take some of their profit to change 20, consumer 20% behavior. percent off on your, on your CPMs? So you're running an ad to No, 20% a, to a Facebook off like the shop. purchase. It was 20% off the purchase price. People were getting massive discounts up to like $20 off buying something. Um, but Facebook was just refunding the user. It wasn't actually coming out of the advertiser's bottom line. Oh, interesting. And that was to get people used to using shops. And they're really invested in changing consumer behavior. So with advertiser, with Advantage Plus, they're investing heavily in getting the advertisers to change the way that they're using the platform in a slightly different style. And best practice for years now has been broad targeting, dynamic creative to find your best ads, and letting that run at lowest cost auto placement which is now maximized conversions or whatnot. Um, or I remember it was auto bit. Uh, they keep changing the name for the same stuff. Uh, but what we're getting with Advantage Plus is they are giving advertisers better results merely because they're using that tool. Because Advantage Plus does three things really well and different than other platforms. Number one, Normally, yeah, the can way you explain what Advantage Plus is to those that don't know, and, I, and maybe yeah. you're, you'll wrap that up into these into these three things. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Advantage Plus is a type; it's an option when you're running a conversion campaign to tap into the Advantage Plus style way of running the algorithm. And what it does differently than a normal conversion campaign is three things. Typically, Facebook spends money on ads because the end user has a good experience with that ad. And then our job is to make sure that the ads that get spend also drive good business results. In Advantage Plus, it's not only saying the end user, but also that person is directly in market to make a purchasing decision. Just a slight nuanced change, but it's more or less like even at prospecting, we're still kind of retargeting people that might very well be in another company's funnel. Um, where at Broad, for instance, I used to run New Balance. And we did initial testing around advanced matching. And we found that up to two thirds of our budget was spent on people that had clicked on our competitors ads and been to their site in the last week. Advantage Plus is basically cranking that up. It's a way more aggressive version of that. Second thing is that it's not allowing for dynamic creative. So you have to put in your best ads. And third only good ads are getting spent. So you can put in really bad ads and push the budget to the moon and you might not get any delivery at all, which is very similar to bid caps and cost cap. So Advantage Plus is basically forcing advertisers to only put out the best ads and to prioritize or isolate those best ads and spend the most amount of money on them so that they get the best results. And really what Facebook is doing is they're putting their thumb on the scale of the market economy so that advertisers are encouraged to make the best form of content so that Facebook users have the best experience. And that is a tremendous change. And we don't know how long that will go on for. Eventually, those costs will come up. But the folks that are taking advantage of it are seeing astronomically, like, just tremendous performance above the baseline. Um, and to give it a small example... I was testing it at 10,000 a day, maybe six months ago, a year ago. I'm now at 35, 40,000 a day on an ad account where I'm spending 80 to 100,000 a day. And nice. that's a huge piece. And to be fair, so it's 30 rushing. to 40% of your total spend is going to, to, yeah. yeah. And we have to understand that yeah. part of the way it's doing that is predicting what people are going to do. So it can't be the majority of your traffic because if all of your people are taking predictions, eventually you run out of data to make good decisions with. And that's a whole other thing for another day. But it's, it's doing interesting. Great. So let, let's dive into creatives just, just for a minute. I do, I do want to kind of uh, underscore something because this is interesting. Something I didn't know about Advantage Plus. But so, so Facebook is rewarding you for just running the best creatives. And in fact, they'll only show the best creatives or, or good creatives. In some ways, that's kind of what Google did early on with their quality score, right? They were mm -hmm. incentivizing you to create a good ad. So they look at click-through rate. They look at keyword relevance. They look at your landing page. 
and they'll actually lower the cost for you. They'll, they'll make yep. it more attractive for you as an advertiser if you create a great ad. So yeah. uh, cost will always go up, right? That's going to happen. But uh, probably going to be some elements of, of that, that that stick around for Facebook, which is interesting. So yeah, and, and, cool. And, so let's, and let's talk creatives. For, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, and that's how Facebook's always worked. This is just a far more aggressive nature than what we've used to seeing. Sort of like how TikTok is the most aggressive content suggestion engine ever. It's sort of like the YouTube suggested video, but on steroids with a nuclear bomb attached to it. Sort of the same thing. Got it. Nice. That's awesome. So uh, let's talk creatives. So so what creatives are working right now and, and or what are some of the creative mistakes that you see brands making right now? Yeah, I mean, I think... Probably the biggest mistake, let's start there. Let, let's tear it down and then build it up. I think the biggest mistake people are making and brands are making is they think that there's a best kind of creative. And so they're constantly chasing whatever that screenshot they saw, what worked. I can tell you this. I'm working with a brand uh, in the clothing business, apparel and accessories. Um, they'll do over 150 million this year. And they run only square static images. I also personally am a partner in a, in a, in a clothing business. And we spend 75, 80% of our money on videos that were kind of designed for reels. Some of it is UGC. Some of it's highly produced. Some of it isn't. The point there is what does work is what you do well and how people are used to hearing from you. Mm. Almost every brand that you know has an identity. Like I'm, I've been sipping on this liquid death, right? So liquid death is great around branding. Unbelievable if liquid brand. death, if you don't know the liquid death story, you got to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. Now if liquid death, what they've done is they basically took the warp tour, Ozfest, all of that type of vibe and they turned it into a water business, which is great. Now, if they came out with an ad that felt like a Gap commercial because everybody else was winning with it, that ad wouldn't do well. Now, it might work for everybody else. Maybe that works for Dasani and it works for you know all the other brands on the shelf next to them, but it wouldn't work for them. And what's most important is figuring out how you can communicate with, inspire trust, in a relationship with your target customer base and then ultimately continue to hammer that home. And think of all the different types of ads that you've seen on television, all the different commercials over the world. And we still have the Geico Gecko. We still have, you know, flow totally. from progressive. We still have yep. the M and M's, right? We still have the polar bears at, at Christmas for Coca-Cola. Know what you do well and leverage that as much as possible. That's the greatest hack to create it. And I, but I love this. What you do well and how people are used to seeing you, what generates trust and then go all in on that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. What, what else? What are your other Yeah, so the most important thing to do in creative is figure out what is your unique positioning in the marketplace. How do you define your own little piece of the pie? And then how do you make that pie bigger? That's really the trick. I will tell you this. If your strategy is to chase what's working, you are only going to ever be a lesser version of 80% of the market. If you want to be elite, figure out your identity and stick with it. Like if you change your clothes and the way you talked, every single day and went out into the world, you have no friend. Like it's the <laughs> same thing. What you're looking to do more than anything in any business is ultimately have relationships with people and direct, especially in direct consumer and e-commerce. What we're trying to do is acquire profitable customer journeys with multiple sales and a long-term relationship for great LTV. That happens because of identity and because of trust. So figure out what you do and then continue to do it. What you do well matters. And so figure out what you do well and continue to do that. 
versus chasing all the other things from everybody else because you're only going to ever do a worse job than the person you're trying to copy. Yeah, I love that. You'll only be, if you're just chasing what works, you'll always be a, 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 you know, a, a second run type of deal. And, and, you know, I make a lot of sports analogies, but to compare this to, to sports, you know, I, I coach basketball. And so if someone said, hey, what, what's the best basketball move? Well, I don't know. What are you, what are you good at? Like, what, yeah. what, what fits you, right? Are you, you're a post player, you're a guard, you got speed, you got size, you got jumping ability, you're a great outside shooter. Like, that's what matters. And then do what yeah. you're really good at. And that totally makes sense when it comes to career yeah, it's as like well. So, okay. Steph Curry versus so, so, yeah. Michael. Yeah, if you did like Steph Curry versus Michael Jordan, well, they're completely different players. Like right. LeBron James right. just scores yeah, so the most points, but he's also shooting 50% more free th- like three pointers than Kareem Abdul Jabbar. I think Kareem Abdul Jabbar has like three attempts behind the three point line. Yeah, well, most, and I have to check the dates, most of all of his career that the three-point line didn't exist, right? So, like, he could, couldn't even do it. Uh, so, yeah, di- different eras, diff- different everything, but, but super yeah. interesting. So, get understand what you're good at and then, and then key on that. Any advice? So, if someone's kind of stuck in that, in that rut of, I'm just chasing what's working, I'm hearing this, this new ad type or this, this type of UGC or this, and I'm just lurching. Um, how does someone understand what are they, what are they good at and then, and then so they can double down on that? Yeah, I think... It's always good to test stuff. It's always good to be uncomfortable and to lose. And you should always have part of your efficiency as a business baked into loss, right? Like if I'm breaking even, I'm probably losing money because it means that I can't test. I can't get better. So I try to bake in the idea of a 5 or 10% loss as normal operating procedure. And hey, look, if you have a retail location, that would be returns and theft and all of that stuff. That's just baked into business. What I think people need to do starting off with is everybody has an identity on how they communicate. Some people are great copywriters. Lean on it. Some people are great on camera. Lean on it. Some people are great graphic designers. How do you get attention? I think it's, there is far too much focus on figuring out how to build the best ad for your business and not nearly enough attention and time and effort put into How does this business already make money? Why don't we just do more of that? And sometimes the easiest ways to turn a struggling seven-figure business into something on a nine-figure run rate is to get rid of every effort that isn't honest and true to who the business is. Like if you have a beautiful product, just show me a picture of the product. You know, like, I brought TRX to market, and if you just took a picture of it, the most beautiful pictures in the world will never sell it. We had to do a video. Uh, Sorry, what is is TRX? The workout equipment from the gym, the the yellow bands. So I brought that back to market. A picture wouldn't do it. We had to show videos. A picture of a a, a rubber band, like what do you do with that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's no concept. So the best way to get somebody's attention, and you know this even when you're trying as a business owner, trying to sell the product and get people interested. What are you doing in person? How are you communicating? You can't just say, hey, look, here's some military grade rope. Like, great. Am I supposed to buy that? What am I supposed to do? And say you can show somebody what's going on and all of a sudden it clicks. Being able to figure out how you can earn somebody's attention and then monetize it has very little to do with like the kind of ad that you run. Like the ads that you run are uh, an appropriation of that knowledge. But... If your business isn't successful enough to have cash flow before you run ads, the ads are never going to make you successful. And I think that's one of the biggest pain points people have is they think the only thing missing is is good ads. Like they think I've got a great business. All I need to do is get on Shark Tank and have somebody give me money. Like that's, that's not, that's not the way that it works. You have to have something that works so you can pour fuel on that fire. Facebook ads is just fuel on the fire. It amplifies your existing business model. So the easiest thing for a business to do, if you want to learn how to make the best ads, is look to how you already make money. What do you do well? And then appropriate that for some paid version of attention. Otherwise, you're going to waste weeks, months, or years uh, of your life just being dishonest with yourself and with your yeah. customers and failing. And, and people, uh, people feel that, right? When, you, when you're not 
totally honest, you're not true to who the brand is or who your product is, people people feel that it comes out in some way in the oh, ad yeah. and it just kills the believability and, and the effectiveness. And I love how you, how you uh, kind of broke that down. It's very simple but very powerful is – how do you best get attention? How do you best get attention for your product? And then how do you how do you best demonstrate it and allow that story to come to life? And and yeah, if I'm selling artwork, maybe just a picture of that is all I need. Or it's like a really unique piece of clothing. Maybe just the picture of it is all I need. But if it's workout bands, a picture of that's not interesting or compelling at all. So so showing the workout and showing the results and showing all of that, um, super interesting. And so really comes down to identity and, and who are you and how do you get there and who are you who are your customers how do you get their attention and how do you show uh why your product is is awesome a- anybody yeah. and, I, and i know this is a bit of a dangerous follow-up because you just said hey don't just chase the best because then you're going to be a second rate version of that but but i do think there's so there's value in getting inspiration there's not mm-hmm. value in copycatting uh but yeah. anybody you would recommend that we pay attention to that just does this exceedingly well where we should try to be remarketed by them or check out their Facebook ad library or something like that. Anybody that's done, doing this really, really well. Yeah. I am, And I get this question all the time. And, and, and what I would say is this, find the people in your business that are your competitors that are better than you. Um, everybody has them. Go be a customer. See how they treat you. Go to their website, add things to cart, shop around, take an idea of what they're, Store feels like, like if you were to start a grocery store today from scratch, you're going to build off of every time you walked into a grocery store, the Publix or the Bonds or the Piggly Wiggly that you're used to going to, right? There's a, there's a format, there's a style. So there's an old saying that I love, you're only as good as who you steal from. And the idea of that is you have an identity, but you need in, in order to really evolve that all of the identities that we have is appropriations of inspirations that we've had. So my totally. best advice, and I'm actually not a huge fan of ad library. I think it's a wildly overvalued resource because it doesn't give you context. If you, you want you to know, know if this what was a good ad, a bad ad or, or somewhere in between, right? You just see that it's an ad. That's all you can. Tell, yeah. Right? Yeah. If you want context, go be a customer of your competitor. Like if you were to spend, I was doing this when I was building 310 nutrition years ago. I literally went to all of our competitors and I bought their products. I joined their communities. And I got to understand the words that people use, the messaging that came across, the content types. My Facebook feed was full of ads. My emails were full of ads. I I had gone through the experience of the person that I'm trying to reach and understood what they're doing. So that I could then go be with them in that stream and just give them an alternative. Coming in just assuming that you deserve any attention from anyone is, well, it's a losing battle. And so my best advice is go out there, experience the world like your consumers. And if something inspires you, you're like, wow, they're just, they're just doing better. Go try it. And what I found is when you're inspired by somebody, you'll appropriate what they're doing in a way that feels more like you than hiring whoever they hired to do that job for you. Like the Harmon brothers got a million people wanting to work for them because of the, you know, because of the, 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 the pooping unicorn ad, right? Right. Yeah. They've only worked squatty potty, yeah. for Squatty Body. Like, right. yes, they're great, but you can't use that ad format for jeans. It just doesn't work. Right. So that's my number one piece of advice is if you want go out, be your customer, be your own customer in the world and see what inspires you and then just appropriate everything possible and have an allowance for failure. And mm. that's where I get some of the best things ever is like somebody built a better mousetrap. I'm going to build it my way and. Some of those ads will last forever. I've got ads that were like that where, and in my women's clothing business, I literally just got ads from Victoria's Secret that I was like, this is amazing. I built a version of that ad and it spent nearly $2 million in the last year. Wow. Wow. Great. I'm not reinventing the wheel. Victoria's Secret's wasting all the money. I'll make one more analogy. We can move on because I know you love analogies and this is one of my favorite. 
McDonald's is the only fast food restaurant that researches locations. Burger King and Wendy's and everybody else puts themselves across the street from McDonald's. Uh. Just be Burger King. They're ridiculously <laughs> successful. Right, right. Yeah, and, and Walmart, or I mean, McDonald's has got the cash and they've got the, they've got the, the methodology. Yeah, let them go. And, and they're more of a real estate business than anything else. A lot of people don't know that. If you watch the movie The Founder, you know that. Like, they're, they're, McDonald's is more about real estate than anything else. So, makes sense. Makes sense that Burger King and the others just you know, go where McDonald's is. I yeah. Love I love it. Um, awesome. So yeah, let's, this such good stuff. I could, I could, we could drill into any of that and have a blast, but let's, let's transition a little bit. So let's talk Facebook or let's talk, uh, let's talk TikTok. So what are you, what are some of your thoughts on, on the short term, near term for TikTok, both organic and on the ad side? I love that. I think it's a really interesting place. What I can say with TikTok and with Facebook, YouTube, any optimized CPM platform, I want to set this table here real quick. And remember that ads are nothing other than organic content that you pay for people to see. Mm -hmm. And they run on the same algorithm. So if something does well organically at earning attention, it will almost assuredly do well as paid media at earning attention. Now, whether or not that attention that you earn is monetizable is something completely different. But with that being said, TikTok is the most aggressive content suggestion engine we've ever seen. And, and what, if you, what do you use mean TikTok, by that? What does that mean it's the most aggressive content suggestion engine? Yeah. So if you were to use TikTok for an hour or two and just swipe on things that you don't like and like the things that you do, you're going to only have a feed full of things that you enjoy. Uh, and you can program TikToks. Like I've done it once where. I was working with a business and what we did is we made a dummy TikTok account and we only went through all of their competitors and liked and watched all the videos, of all the competitors. Now, whenever they open up TikTok, it's merely just an inspiration machine. And so the point of that is it's extraordinarily personalized. It knows what you're watching and wants to show you more content like that with a million different data points that they're looking at. And I think that that is something that no other platform can do because it's not really in the nature of that platform to do it. YouTube rabbit holes, we all know about that. It works on a slightly different thing. YouTube rabbit holes is more about the topic of the conversation than maybe the style of the delivery, right? The keywords and all of that stuff, which is great. And then in Facebook, they show you content based on what you like to see, based on all the websites you've been to and all the places that you've been and where you spent money that time of year or what you're in the market for. TikTok is very much about like, this is what gets somebody to spend five seconds of their eyeball here. We're going to give you that as much as possible. And with that in mind, I don't think any other platform will be fundamentally able to make TikTok obsolete because it would be out of their core user experience to do so. I think that probably the closest we will get is Instagram Reels. Or maybe even Facebook reels that are inside the app because those don't have an identity as much yet other than trying to be TikTok. Um, yeah, yeah. When it comes to TikTok ads, uh, I think that if you hit on creative that does well, you can do exceptionally well with it. There is a huge issue with TikTok or a difference between TikTok and Facebook. There are two huge differences. Number one, a good Facebook ad can run for years. Anybody that says, insists that ad fatigue is real, that's, that's misinformation. Um, I've had ads that have run for two, three, four years. That, that, I've ads that I built four or five years ago that every now and again I still see in my feed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like that stuff happens. The, 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 the half-life, the longevity of a Facebook ad is basically forever. And same with YouTube. TikTok, same with YouTube, yeah, the same. We, we've got YouTube ads we've run for years and spent millions of dollars on the same yeah. ad. It just keeps cranking. Like my buddy Sean Cannell from Think Media, he's got like an affiliate video of like uh, Father's Day gifts. And every year in like every year in June, he makes like he gets, you know, an extra couple million views and a big check. Like 
It just happens like clockwork. He made that thing in like 2013 or something like that. TikTok, though, maybe two weeks. Mm. That's all the ever long. That's all however long it'll work. Because TikTok is also part of that suggestion engine is also new. The, the aspect of new as a value point is extremely high. Now, you could maybe run something again in a couple of months and it'll work great. But it means that the churn rate of content is massive. And that churn rate has far more to do with time than with money. You could, that ad might last for two weeks if you're spending 50 bucks a day. It might last for two weeks if you're spending 20,000 a day. So there's a big issue there. And being able to consistently deliver that quality of content that's monetizable. And the other side of TikTok ads is it'll never be as smart as Facebook, Google, or, or Facebook or Google. Um, and it has far more to do with the fact that Facebook and Google have a, a leg up of over a decade of, con- of communication and location and transactional data. So yep. – I think there are places where businesses can leverage TikTok as their unfair advantage in the marketplace to scale. I think ultimately, though, there are few scenarios where TikTok is an evergreen, isolated growth and acquisition channel at scale. It just won't work because... totally makes sense. Other places are better at acquiring cash flow in a more stable fashion. So it's it's just too hyperbolic and honestly just not smart enough. Yep. And it can never catch up because as fast as it gets better, everything else is getting better faster. Right. Totally makes sense. Love it. I, we, we could drill into that too, but we were, we're running out of time. So I want to transition <laughs> and talk AI for just a minute. So how are you using chat GPT or other AI to help give you superpowers or give you an edge or, or help make your marketing better? Yeah, I love it. Um, I mean, ChatGPT is the latest version uh, of the AI. And to be fair, I've been using Facebook's version of that for years. Um, it's called Dynamic Creative. And I don't actually don't spend a single penny on Facebook without having ads tested and proven and created through Dynamic Creative, which is Facebook's version of ChatGPT. Um, and, and so that's a superpower in that I literally will only ever test in that environment. I never have a single account with a single penny spent on anything that's not developed that way. Um, and for Facebook, I use something called the 322 method, which is three creatives, two headlines, two sets of copy. And we could dive into that forever. But the point of it is that's giving the AI the best opportunity to create the best user experience so that ultimately I'm buying the lowest priced attention for the highest quality user and targeting the individuals in the most sustainable way to attract the most consistent type of attention. And from then it's my business model that monetizes it. Using tools like ChatGPT to handle the copy side of things, I think is something a lot of people are using. Um, as, as a very light end, I, I'm using ChatGPT to develop you know, YouTube titles and, and email uh, headlines, right? Uh, to see what gets good open rates and checking against vidIQ keyword scores. And to be fair, those are also really, really great for my Facebook ads. Um, if, this gets a, if this gets a lot of clicks on YouTube and a great email open rate, well, you better believe when I've dropped that on a Facebook ad, it's going to crush. Absolutely. I think it's also really important to use ChatGPT, though, as a way of understanding how consumers behave so you can put in there like give me 50 reasons why somebody has this pain point and and use that to understand concepts in market research um my friend sarah levenger has a great way that she's using chat gp to effectively extract psychological uh data points on users um and using that as a tool to something like that like yeah. So so what she's doing is she's taking in, for instance, say all the comments from a Facebook, from an Instagram, say an Instagram post went viral and it's got 30,000 comments. We can grab all of those comments and all of those words that are being used and throw it into chat GPT. One of the things that I love to do is say, hey, tell me the 10 most important things in this 5,000 word article or something like that. 5,000 character piece. And it'll break it down for you. 
Um, and if you want to do that in even a more well, really actionable way is say you've got a 30 minute YouTube video, get yourself a transcription of it, drop it, drop into chat GPT and tell me what are the 10 most important things mentioned here. And then you can literally t- ask it to tell me more about line item three, four, and five. And then boom, you got a 5,000 word description and mini ebook done like that. And it takes no time at all. The point is you can use all of these things to understand what's going on. What I will say is what it does that I'm very bullish on and I'm a huge fan of is that it can do the collation of data and the sorting of data at scale in a way that tremendously saves you time. Ultimately, you're still going to have to qualify and use insight to appropriately take what it's giving you and take action on it. Um, yeah, like people yeah. know when they're reading something written by AI, I wouldn't use it as a right. cop. I, I don't think it's gonna, the best for SEO. Uh, on like, I'm just building up, blasting out blog pages, but it can give you a great insight to be a way to inspire your thought process and to also take huge sums of data and make it very simple to read. And I think that's at least in the way that I'm using it right now, some of the most powerful things. And, and Sarah Levenger, um, if you don't know her, you should absolutely check her out. She's the, she's a stud. She's, she's the best at, at consumer psychology. And that's one of the things that she's doing a lot of. And um, I was really inspired by her with that. But just the idea of using AI yeah. to take insight from the written word is tremendous. And to also inspire different ways of thinking in a way that gets you out of your own head. I think those are some of the most important yeah, things so that you can use it for. And, and I think it really comes down to a lot of what you described comes down to two things, right? Asking the AI better questions, right? You only get yeah. good results if you ask good questions. And if you give it good data, like, hey, look at all these comments, some of the, the top 10 takeaways. But then being able to quantify and qualify and say, yeah, but it's really these things, right? Or this doesn't really make sense, but this yeah. does so, um, yeah, I love it, man. I'm super excited. We're using it as a team and, and really just playing around with it. I think that's a key to just play around with it and see what, uh, see what you learn and uh, new ideas will be sparked as you go. So let's do this, Charles. I know we got a hard stop in just a couple minutes. Um, I know you're very active on TikTok. You're a great follow on TikTok, good follow on Twitter, LinkedIn. Where can people connect with you and then out on the socials and then talk about um, how they can connect with you at Disruptor School? Yeah, so I'm at CT the Disruptor on all socials and at Dis- uh, Disruptor School on all socials. And you can go to DisruptorSchool.com to check it out. Um, if you are on a social media account where you're not seeing me, let me know and I'll make sure to add it into the flywheel. But I'm literally <laughs> everywhere all day, all the time, um, which is yeah. sort of my unfair advantage. I-, I love making content and talking to people. I think my wife would wish that I put my phone away a little bit more. But hey, look, that's my life. <laughs> these, are the, these are the problems that I have. Um, yeah, and then, dude, yeah, dude, you're very good at content. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, keep going. Well, I was gonna say, yeah, I think there's a bit of a delay as we're recording this. We'll get that cleaned up in the in the edit. But um, I've speaking of TikTok being aggressive, you're a great follow on TikTok. I'm not an avid TikTok user, so I'll just just put that disclaimer out there. But I, I have been trying to use it a little bit more lately, and for whatever reason, TikTok thinks that I love Tar- uh, Charles Titchener because I see you all of the time on TikTok, which is actually great. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, man. I, it's nice to know where those 200 views are coming from. It's just Brett three, all, all day <laughs> it's all long. Me. It's all me. You're welcome. Huh? I love it. I'll take it. <laughs> uh, that's awesome, man. So I'll, I'll link to everything. I'll link to your socials. We'll link to the Disruptor School. So definitely check it out. And Charles Titchener, ladies and gentlemen, man, you crushed it. Thank you so much. I can't wait to schedule another one because there were so many things that we didn't dive into. That oh, we yeah. Need to. So uh, round, round two is coming, buddy. I would love it. And anybody watching this and listening, any anybody listening to this, if you have questions on any of this stuff, write back to Brett and maybe we can just do another like, maybe a mailbag show something, dive in deep. We, we went an inch deep, a mile wide today. Let's go a mile deep and just make it really fun. Do a little ask me anything. Yeah, fire those questions away, send them, send them my way, and then we can get Charles back in for round two. Charles, thanks, buddy. I know you got a split, but really appreciate the time. A ton of fun, man. All right. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. And as always, thank you for tuning in. Let us know what you'd like to hear more of or less of on the show. And yes, if you got questions for Charles, fire my way or connect with him on the socials. And with that, until next time, 
Thank you for listening.